Well, good afternoon. What a great conference we are all attending. It is wonderful. This is my first visit to Sweden, and I've met many wonderful people, and I'm looking forward to meeting many more. Thank you for inviting me to come and to speak. And I wanted to speak this afternoon on praying God's word, using the God's word in prayer. So I'm going to start, as I believe we should do, in a prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. I ask now that by your Holy Spirit you would come and speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us, and that you would be in our midst through the power of your Spirit. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Martin Luther said these words, the soul can do without everything except the word of God. And Charles Spurgeon, referring to John Bunyan, said, if you cut him, he would bleed scripture. Now, I don't know about you, but I, don't, I certainly know about me, but I don't think if you cut me, I would bleed scripture. But I do love the word of God. A few years ago, we were having a prayer meeting during Lent, and a group of us were focusing before the prayer meeting began, asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And as we quietened our hearts and minds, God gave me one word, and the word was twitch. Now, I don't know if you can, is that, um, can you translate that into Swedish? Do you have the word twitch? Do you know what twitch means? It means you have a, <laughs> whatever, what was the word? Ticks, yeah, ticks. So I thought, Lord, does that mean everyone tonight in the prayer meeting is going to be going, and the Lord said, no, don't worry. He said, it is a mnemonic. Again, I'm not sure how you translate mnemonic, but if you take each letter, T-W-I-T-C-H, and immediately God said, it stands for the word in the center of our hearts. And I thought, yes, Lord. If the word is in the center of our hearts, then Jesus is in the center of our hearts because it says in the beginning of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if we have the word in the center of our hearts, we have Christ in the center of our hearts. One of my favorite scriptures is in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verse 29, and this is what it says. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Whoa, that is powerful. And if God's word is like fire, we know that fire has power. If there's a fire in the house, we pay attention. There is heat, there is refining, there is power. But do we pay attention to God's word? Proverbs 4 verse 20 says this, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life for those who find them and health to a man's whole body. So when we pay attention, the word of God brings salvation, healing, deliverance, freedom, hope, and power. The list could be longer. 
But we all need Christ's power in order to be his witnesses. Amen? Amen. A little bit more certain. Amen? I can't do anything without the power of God's Spirit. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said to the disciples whilst they were in Jerusalem, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't know if you've experienced God's power, but I um, want to tell you uh, one very significant time in my life. In 1990, we had a conference in our church in London where we were teaching on the gift of prophecy. And we had a number of people who had flown over from the USA, from Kansas City. They were known as the Kansas City Prophets because they walked in this gifting in a powerful way. Now, we knew that these men heard God very clearly. And my pastor, Sandy Miller, asked them if they would meet and pray with a number of staff members. And because we knew they really did hear God, we thought, well, we better make sure they don't listen to God about anything that we've done wrong in our lives, any sin, as it were. So everybody who was about to receive prayer, you could see them walking around outside just praying, Lord, Lord, I repent of this, I repent of that. <laughs> and um, as Nicky Gumbel once said, before he ever led an Alpha Holy Spirit weekend, he actually repented of everything, going back to his childhood, even to when he was a baby, and he threw the rattle out of the cot. So there were a number of us who were being prayed for, and I repented of everything I could think of that God would not want to reveal through these prophets. <laughs> so uh, it was a lunchtime session, and uh, in came these prophets, and uh, they sat down, and uh, we said, hello, how are you? A little nervous we were. And uh, one of the prophets said, oh, I've got a terrible headache. And immediately, you know, you can imagine, we all felt well, if he's got a headache, he won't give us very accurate words. So we said, um, can we pray for you? Because I love praying for healing. So he said, yes. So we gathered around, and I stood behind him, and I had my hand just hovering over his head. And as I sort of just about touched his hair, I thought, oh my goodness, this is what Brill Cream feels like. <laughs> Obviously, you have Brill Cream in, in, in Sweden. I thought, well, I don't have brothers, and my father doesn't use Brill Cream. I thought, wow, it's a bit stiff. And, and then I thought, oh my goodness, he knows what I'm praying. So, I, so I, I repented immediately. I said, Lord, I repent. I repent. And then I immediately started to pray for healing for this man. Um, Anyway, so there were four of us, and I was the last of the group to be prayed for, and uh, there were two, two of the prophets, and I sat opposite one of them at the table when it was my turn, and he just said to me, Emmy, could you put up your hands? So I put up my hands like that, and then he put up his hands like that, and then he leant forward and he touched my hands. And as he touched my hands, twin. 50,000 volts went through my body and I was stuck to this part. I promise you, it was like that. I could not move. And then the fear of God came on me. I thought, oh my goodness, if this is God's power, it is awesome. And I began to sob in the presence of God. And then uh, he and the other prophets started to give me uh, the words they felt God giving. And part of the words, and none of it made sense at the time, but fortunately it was recorded, so I was able to write it down in my journal later. But part of the words they gave me was that I would be a key unto many people whom themselves could no longer be free. That I would be right in the middle of the Salvation Army uh, revealing the love of Christ to people in a mighty way. And on it went. And I uh, went home from this encounter. I 
sort of decoded the, the tape and wrote it in my journal. And it was a mystery. I thought, I don't understand what this means at all. But three months later, my pastor, Sandy Miller, approached me and said he was working on the board of visitors of Holloway Prison, which is the biggest women's prison in London, that he'd been talking to the chaplain and the chaplain was very overworked with all the pastoral needs of the women and had asked Sandy if someone from our church could perhaps get involved. And because I was on the staff, uh, I thought Sandy was asking my advice. So I thought, yes, I wonder who could get involved. Um, mm. And then Sandy has this wonderful way of looking straight through you, I'm sure Anders will know. And he said, well, actually, Em, I thought of you. And I went, oh no, not prisons. Because I, I mean, I went to boarding school. That was like being in prison. <laughs> um, and then I said to Sandy, well, why me, Sandy? And he said in a throwaway line, I think you'd be quite good at it. So I said, please, can I go away and pray and think about this? And I went home. I got out this journal and I reread those words, a key unto many whom themselves can no longer be free. I thought, oh no, that sounds like prisons to me. <laughs> anyway, so I went for an interview, and as they say, the rest is history, because basically uh, I, I got accepted by the chaplain, and um, I started to work at Holloway Prison, um, and God broke my heart. He broke my heart with his ministry. But then... Um, in 1994, and it's not that I wasn't prayed for in between to know God's power, but in 1994, the Holy Spirit was moving with great power around the world. At the time, I was exhausted. By then, I'd been working on the church staff for nine years, and I was walking across to a lunchtime meeting, just having this conversation with God, which was along the lines of, Lord, I am so tired in ministry. I am so weary in all that I'm doing. I really think I perhaps will give up. And I went to this meeting at lunchtime. We were every Tuesday discussing our Sunday services. And at the time, Nikki Gumbel, who is uh, the person who has developed the Alpha course, was meant to lead that meeting, but he was somewhere else. I knew where he was. And um, he came back right as we were finishing the meeting, stood at the door and said, I'm really sorry I've missed the meeting, but I've got to go. And he turned around and started to walk out. And I knew he had been that morning at a meeting where he had heard what God was doing in the outpouring of God's spirit in that little church, that vineyard church in Toronto. So I said to him, Nikki, tell us about where you've been and what happened. He said, I haven't got time. And I said, please close this meeting at least in a prayer. And all he said was a short prayer along the lines of, thank you, Lord, that you are moving in power by your spirit. Bless this group in Jesus' name. Amen. And as he began to turn around and walk out, the Spirit of God fell on those of us in the room. Now, don't forget, I had been tired and weary and wanting to give everything up. But as the Spirit of God fell on me, I, it was like I fell in love with Jesus in a way I had never been in love with Jesus. I'd been a Christian since 1980. But as the Spirit filled me, I had what I call this googly feeling in my stomach, whereby it's like, oh, I love you so much, Lord. Um, I've never been in love. I'm a single lady. But this was the best feeling I have ever had in my life. And then it was like I was so excited that I had this cry from my belly that went, whoa, Jesus. It was like, whoa, I love you so much. Now, I'm quite a together lady. I am quite normal. Um, I am a nurse by profession. I, I was a sister in the hospital uh, where we did all the fiber optic work. And I behave quite normally. Uh, normally. Um, but on this occasion, I was just so in love with Jesus and so excited that I was just sitting there going, oh, like this. And then I started to pray for everybody I could think of. I prayed for all my non-Christian friends that they would experience the love of Christ. I prayed for every enemy in the world I could think of, including uh, Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. You know, I just wanted everybody to experience the love of God like I was at that moment. And at the time, I said, Lord, I love you so much, I don't mind where you send me or where I go. And three months later, Nikki Gumbel rings me up one morning, um, 
saying, Emmy, we've got a lady on our alpha course here in London who has a boyfriend in prison in Exeter. Uh, he rang me yesterday saying, would I go down and explain about the alpha course? He said, my diary's a bit full, but I told him I knew someone I could send. And he said to me, Em, you work in prisons in, in, in uh, London, would you take a team down to Exeter? And I went, no, Nikki, I could never go into a men's prison. I only have ever walked into a women's prison. And Nikki said, just speak to the chaplain. He sounds really nice. And uh, <laughs> so I rang the chaplain, he was very nice, and went down with a team in December 1994 to introduce Alpha in that men's prison. And that was the start of the Alpha ministry in the prisons, unbeknown to me. But it was all because at the time, as I was being filled with God's spirit, and I said, Lord, I don't mind where you send me or where I go. And when I stood in that chapel with all these very naughty men, I mean, they had done terrible things, I remember feeling utterly safe with no fear whatsoever and just a love for these men that they would come to know Jesus Christ. And one of the men I got to know very well there because um, uh, we, we, we did Exeter Prison first, but then the chaplain moved to Dartmoor Prison, which is the oldest prison in England. The, the walls are this thing. They were built by the Napoleonic uh, prisoners. And um, uh, he moved to that uh, chapel, and one of his chapel orderlies was a guy called Finney. Now, Finney used to walk around even when he was on duty in the chapel with his Bible like this. And I said to him one day, Finney, why do you always have your Bible like that? And he said, because it's the sword of the spirit and I can wield it at any time and speak into someone's life. I thought, wow, <laughs> I don't do that. But you know something, he loved God's word and he used to write me letters that were end to end scripture. I had to even look up the scriptures to make sure they were real, because he seemed to find scriptures that I had never even seen in the word before. And of course, we know from Ephesians chapter six that the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon used in the armor of God. And we need God's protection from the enemy. We have an enemy. I work a lot in Africa now. I travel to Africa to introduce Alpha in the prisons there. And there, they have witch doctors everywhere. In fact, um, uh, in November 2011, I was ordained in northern Uganda, and a converted witch doctor gave his testimony at my ordination in front of 4,000 people. And he said to all this group, he said, many of you are politicians, some of you are bishops, and some of you are clergy, and many of you who came to see me when I was a witch doctor, and you need to repent. And they know about spiritual spells and, and the enemy there. Um, but the word of God, we know, is the sword of the spirit, and we can use it as a weapon against the enemy in amazing ways. Because praying God's word is powerful. I uh, used to lead our early morning prayer meetings in our church for quite some years. And we always start at seven in the morning for one hour. And I used to prepare the day before on a Monday. And as I was praying one uh, week in, in February, I felt God say to me to open the prayer meeting by reading Psalm 29. Would you like to turn with me to Psalm 29? Um, and I prepared a, an agenda for this prayer meeting, and I bike everywhere in London. And I left home that morning, beautiful uh, sky, there wasn't a cloud in sight. And uh, at the beginning of the prayer meeting at 7 a.m., after a couple of songs of worship, I read to everybody at the prayer meeting Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then it goes on in verse three. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, 
Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Now, as I read this psalm, as I got to verse 3, the God of glory thunders. There was this great clap of thunder outside. Now, do you remember I said on my bike coming to the church, it was clear, blue, clear sky. And then there were flashes of lightning that lit up the room, and everybody in the room went, whoa! Because we, as we were reading the word, there were signs literally outside happening. So I suppose I was excited by this. So as we were praying for various things, we started to use this psalm to pray for each of the situations. And one of the things we were praying for that morning was that I was going to be leading a three-day mission to Dartmoor Prison uh, about two weeks afterwards. So we started to pray that the God of glory would thunder over Dartmoor Prison, that the God of glory would strike the prison with lightning, that the God of glory, and on we went. And at lunchtime that day, I had to ring the chaplain just to make some arrangements. And probably 15 seconds into the call, the, the, the line went dead. I thought, that's a bit strange. He doesn't normally put the phone down in my ear. And I rang back a few minutes later, and the... Uh, uh, person who answered the phone, uh, the switchboard said, the prison has been struck by lightning. We've had a thunderstorm. I went, oh. So he said, all the lines are down. So about half an hour later, the chaplain rang me from a payphone outside the prison, and he said to me, as I was talking to him, there was this huge clap of thunder and a strike of lightning, and all the lights had gone out in the prison. And I went, Bill, go and read Psalm 29. He said, why? I said, Bill, this morning we were praying for you and we prayed Psalm 29 over the prison. I said, look, you're on a payphone. Let's ring to, uh, speak tonight. So that evening he rang me and he was trembling. I said, Bill, what's wrong? He said, I live one hour's drive across from Dartmoor in Exeter. He said, when I got to my, uh, the road where I live, I could not drive down the road because a huge cedar of Lebanon had been also struck by lightning and had fallen across the road. Have you read verse 5? The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. So our attention was you know, grasped by all of these things. And so this was Tuesday. That Sunday, normally the chapel service only had six, seven people. That Sunday, suddenly 25 men came to chapel. Unheard of. The next night, Monday night, they were starting the Alpha course in that prison. 16 men on that first night. And on that first night, who is Jesus? Nine of those men gave their life to Christ at the end of that talk. This is unheard of. But I believe it's because as we prayed God's word over that prison, something remarkable happened. So as you can see, I love God's word. I love using it, especially in prayer meetings. So what we thought we would do now is to have uh, a prayer meeting. Because in our church, up until the early 90s, we didn't have any corporate prayer at all. I've been on staff since 1985 uh, in our church. I've been worshipping there since 1980. But there didn't used to be any corporate prayer meetings at all. And then we had a sense that as Alpha started to grow and other things began to start, that if we weren't having as a deep foundation uh, a bedrock of prayer, that as these ministries grew, they would literally just topple over if the foundation wasn't in prayer. And because we knew it would be a struggle to start anyone wanting to come to a prayer meeting because there were none, 
four of us began to meet on a regular basis to birth prayer by praying that God would birth prayer in our church. And we then started a early morning prayer meeting on a Tuesday morning. And we learnt that if you are to have a prayer meeting that people want to come to, that is going to be effective, it needs to be well led. And because it's an early morning meeting, we realized that we had to start on time and finish on time. So if people needed to get home or get to work, they knew that at 8 a.m. we would be finishing. But also, um, we knew that if we had a prayer meeting that wasn't properly led and people didn't really know what was happening, then they would get bored very quickly. So always we would say, Lord, what would you like us to pray for? How can we pray? Um, in this one hour that you've given us. And we would always intersperse our prayer meeting with worship, because worship in itself, the worship words and songs can um, be prayers in themselves, but also it connects us right at the beginning as we pray. And we also realized that if we started to use different models of prayer, then people would not fall asleep. <laughs> uh, and one can be very creative as a result. Uh, I was just speaking to Anders uh, uh, about a prayer meeting we had uh, a few years ago on the River Thames. The Thames, as you know, if you've been to London, passes lots of main sites like the Houses of Parliament, uh, St Paul's Cathedral, uh, you know, lots of different places. And if you take a boat and you pray, you moor the boat outside the different places you're about to pray for, just the vision of having the Houses of Parliament in front of you gives you great... Um, faith as you're praying. And there was one occasion when we were having one of these prayer boats <laughs> and the boat caught fire. Um, I seem to know a lot about fire. Um, and we had to quickly get the boat to the edge of the, of the river and get everybody off. It was the, it was, you know, the, the, the room where we were praying was filled with smoke and I thought, I don't think this is God's glory. <laughs> I, it smells like smoke. Um, so we then came off the boat and we then had to have our prayer meeting in public on the riverbank of the Thames, which was quite embarrassing because as the public walked by, they were sneering at us and going, ha, ah, look at you Christians, you know. So it was good. It was good. We had to be, you know, keep going. But um, prayer meetings can be exciting. And just on New Year's Eve, every New Year's Eve for the last probably nearly 20 years, we have held a New Year's Eve prayer party. I've been to everyone except for probably two, uh, and this year the church was so full, not only on the ground floor and the galleries, but in the crypt as well. And there were people queuing all the way down our drive and all the way to, almost to Harrods, um, along Knightsbridge, that we had to send some people away. There were that many people. And for two hours we prayed, and then as midnight struck, we had a, a video screen of Big Ben and all the fireworks. But prayer now is a central part of everything we do. So what we're going to do is, is have a prayer meeting now. Yesterday afternoon, a group of us sat in the little room upstairs, um, and we said, Lord, what would you like us to pray for in this prayer meeting? And we had a sense that God wanted us to pray into three areas. Uh, if the worship bank could come up, that'd be great. Um, the first area is to pray for ourselves. The second area is to pray for our churches. And the third area is to pray for our towns and cities. And what I'm going to do is be using the word of God in each of these sections as we pray. But as I said, uh, we always start with uh, some worship. So we're going to have uh, a couple of songs. Is that good? Yeah. Um, and so if you'd like to stand and then just imagine you have come from your homes, you've come uh, on your way to work, or maybe you're going back if you're a mum to your homes afterwards. But this is a 7 a.m. prayer meeting that you've come to. And we'll start with worship. So if you'd like to stand, I'm going to stay up here because uh, I'll be leading it. <laughs> 